Able to hear me okay? Yep. Yes. So here are my disclosures. Um, I think just want to highlight the uh, bottom one that I've never had a conflict uh, with Mazur. Um, I do uh, teach a lot of these courses um, now for Medtronic uh, over the last uh, couple years. <laughs> So I think like we've already pointed out, there are many different tools. And I think uh, as we'll continue to learn and really what's going on right now, it's navigation, navigation and robotics are really combining into one current system. We think of this uh, certainly very much like what's going on um, in other areas of technology where a company like Tesla, 96% of their cars are automated. Um, the construction um, is as such. And I think that's hugely beneficial. We know that robotic technology is a little bit different than navigation has been pointed out and that it's really based upon segmentation, uh, which is the ability for the bony anatomy itself to drive this. We don't worry about things, um, as Terry had pointed out in the last couple of talks about bumping the fiducial or being an issue with the alignment, uh, because if that changes, the segmentation still stays on track. The one benefit now of the systems that are incorporated where navigation is incorporated into robotic technology with the robotic arm is that it uses that really as belts and suspenders. So there's a really nice way to check comparatively. So really how does all this work? And I think one of the things that they asked me to talk about is the quad rod technique with the MIS applications. And so I think it's incredibly important really just uh, coming upon the discussion that we had was, you know, how do we do this different than navigation for me? And this is a different workflow. Um, one of the uh, things that we know now with, robotic technologies, there's, there are two basic ways to do it. What I do is I do a preoperative CT scan. What that does uh, in contradistinction to what Terry does is that it then allows all this stuff to be done and automated before I come into the OR. You can also do what's called an interoperative scan and plan where you come into the room, just like we do for navigation, we bring the you know, OR in or arrow C in, uh, you can spin the patient, that then gets fed back into the system, and you can really do it with uh, similar steps to what we currently do navigation. I like the pre-op CT scan for a couple reasons. Uh, one is that it saves me a lot of time interoperably. There's no arm spin uh, during surgery. We all have, uh, we have all the plans and screws ahead of time. And so then we can incorporate this into a planning software. And especially with some of the cases I'll show at the end that I've published with uh, Martin Pham, who's really uh, um, done uh, these uh, types of cases is the planning is really critical to really understand what you're doing. These planning software uh, technologies now are incredibly powerful, much better than the ones we've uh, used for the last 10 or 15 years and that to become very much automated. We know now you can see on the right hand side, the values in red are ones that aren't within normal parameters versus the ones in green are we can then optimize our construct. And so if you're doing a small one or two or three level case, uh, that's obviously different than doing a uh, T1 to the ilium uh, type case, but you can see we can um, visualize really accurately and really plan what we're doing. So we can almost essentially go into a preoperative planning lab, very similar to orthopedic surgeons who have done, done joint arthroplasty, whether they do, have done it in training where we use templates. We do a lot of that stuff ahead of time. In addition, we get a surgical plan. And so this surgical plan then goes out to the NRC, the scrub tech, the circulator, the fellow, um, the sales rep, and we know exactly what screws we're going to use. Sometimes we do change these a little bit, but it's pretty uncommon. And so if you're doing a one, IS, uh, one level MAST lift, like Terry pointed out, those four screws are ready to go. They're on the back table. They're preloaded. Once again, that just saved, that shaves a couple minutes off itself, but really everyone understands what we're doing. Certainly for smaller cases, uh, we can plan out different things like skin incision, avoiding the facets, but when we talk about doing really complex high-end MIS applications of this technology, all these things are incredibly important because once again, we're gonna look at where the extend tabs and the towers are gonna to intersect. Um, and that often ends up being one of the really challenging areas of these types of procedures. In addition, the placement of S2AS screws is incredibly straightforward. It takes about 40 seconds to place an S2AS screw and really uh, completely differently than when we do open technique, we can save about two inches of skin incision and a huge amount of dissection because we don't need to see the start point. We just need to obviously have the skin exposed so we can place our cannula, but we can also place these with a percutaneous technique as well. And one of the real benefits of using uh, these types of technologies, even comparatively uh, or compared to navigation, is we can see how they line up. 
And so before we talk about, you know, some of the MIS, like MIS applications, I think we really need to look at a relatively, what I call a relatively straightforward deformity case. So this is a 60 year old gentleman with about a 65 degree thoracolumbar lumbar curve. They also have some thoracic kyphosis. So we can once again, look at the sagittal and the coronal imbalance and realize we're gonna to have to do quite a bit of correcting to be able to get this patient better aligned, not just in terms of his spinal alignment, but also in terms of his sagittal and coronal balance. So we get our supine film, not much flexibility. Uh, we look at our obviously imaging in terms of MRIs and preoperative CT scans to see where we have to do our decompressions, where the neural impingement is, but then we can incorporate it and import it into this planning software. So now we basically see, um, as sort of Pat just pointed out, is we can see where the screws are placed. The systems now, you can look and visualize exactly what the screw looks like. Um, and so if we were to get intraoperative fluoro spots or intraoperative uh, even x-rays to make sure our screws looked pretty accurate, they should really line up and be exactly like this is on this uh, standing film. In addition, we can measure our sagittal profile. We know all the parameters, we know what our alignment's going to be, and we know where we have to perform our correction. We then can once again look at the coronal and sagittal parameters. In addition, you can see the rod length at the bottom. So we know exactly how long our rod should be um, as we place our schematic. But I think more importantly, we can do things like perform osteotomies and go through our planning process. And so, which I think this is incredibly beneficial for surgeons, but incredibly beneficial for residents and fellows to say, I'm gonna perform three or four or five posterior column osteotomies, what should the curve look like? And then you can see obviously from doing this, our rod length is gonna change as well. So we know how long this is gonna be before we even start. It's another basically check and balance to understand that if we do this, we're gonna end up with all green values on the right-hand side and that we're gonna restore not just our coronal, but also our sagittal parameters. So incredibly beneficial to think through these things. And this is really start to finish for one uh, particular screw. And so I think as was similarly stated, this is you know not sped up. Um, you can see our navigation screen in the back. And so that really acts as a nice checks and balance to see how quickly um, we're placing this in terms of how deep we're going. Um, and this was really one of our first cases with this uh, new system, which incorporates uh, stealth navigation into the robotic platform. And so the, obviously this is a large open case, uh, but once again, even including tapping, which we don't always do uh, with all the steps, really just to make sure the navigation lines up every single time, we can get through placement of a pedicle screw in relatively quick uh, order comparatively. And here we can end up with a nice uh, case with good coronal and sagittal alignment. You can see what we do in the uh, coronal plane. And here we have multiple rods, but we also have what we call a kickstand rod, which really helps us push the patient back over into appropriate coronal alignment in terms of their CSVL. But can we make this MIS? And so we now have a couple of publications, uh, Martin Pham, who's listed there, as well as Joe Osario, were my fellows over the uh, course of the last two or three years. And Martin's really, um, uh, I guess he's a lot more patient than I am, is probably the easiest way to say it. Um, so he's really tried to incorporate the, the use of the anti-SOAS approach as well as uh, using this technology to see, can he do cases, um, essentially, you know, we can call it less invasive, I think, but once again, as you'll see, we're still pretty invasive uh, comparatively. So this is a revision case. A patient obviously had, uh, has uh, upper thoracic uh, kyphosis or thoracolumbar kyphosis. Um, is doing relatively uh, poorly after a two-level uh, uh, open uh, T-lift procedure. We can then uh, take these films and port it into the system. We look at the CT scan rendering. We can see there's a little bit of improvement of his uh, thoracolumbar kyphosis. Um, and then the planning software comes into play. And so um, he can manipulate this. He can see what the rod system is going to look like, see how they're going to link up, see where the skin incisions are going to look like. And ultimately with separate fascial incisions without opening up the entire posterior uh, column um, to disrupt all the soft tissue, he can look what these are going to look like um, in terms of a proper photo. But I think most of us can also say, well, it looks a little bit uh, for the people on the call here uh, and on the video, this is like the joust uh, arcade game that was unfortunately probably before Terry's time, but um, for some of us that are a little bit older, um, these things are sticking all over the place. And so it's incredibly important to be able to manage this as you do these uh, types of surgeries, because here's the interoperable fluoro. And so we can see this, but once again, this is just like we dropped a bunch of extended tab pedicle screws on the field and doesn't really help us uh, to do that. 
But here's the post-op result. And I think in terms of the alignment, um, it's uh, very rigid. We have uh, four forms of uh, fixation into the pelvis. Uh, this once again takes quite a bit of planning, but it does take long to do these surgeries. You can see here in the, our publication, uh, these are Martin's times uh, comparatively. And so you get to be uh, relatively long because there's a lot of stuff that goes involved with it, especially when you do it in one day. Another case with significant sagittal alignment, previous uh, failed uh, fusion with some peak rods, once again, planned out uh, to see what it's going to look like with the use of the anti psoas approach to help uh, access the anterior aspect of the spine. And once again, continuing to play this uh, game of joust as we place implants uh, with these uh, systems and with previous broken uh, sacral screws to be able to work around those, do different techniques, S2I versus standard iliac fixation. We once again can use all the things at our fingertips that uh, these uh, systems and understanding really allow us to do to be able to do these cases very reproducibly. And I think like Terry pointed out, I do think that this really is the great equalizer uh, when it comes to uh, technology as well as learning curve. And really at this point, we're collecting times this year with myself versus my fellow and I'm over 450 robotic assisted cases now in the last uh, four or so years um, versus my fellows who've never used it before. And our times for screw placement are not that significant. Uh, maybe it just means that I'm still not that good or that they're much quicker at the, the learning curve uh, than I am. Um, and you can see here what's our final lateral construct. I think in addition, one of the other things that we can do is single position surgery. And so this has certainly got a lot of fanfare with one and two level cases, um, but also, uh, you know, Martin's really taken this to the next level. And one of our publications uh, here is looking at uh, doing even multi-level constructs um, to be able to do this once again, figuring out a rod length ahead of time, knowing a lot of the things that we start out with that we're going to do, I think these once again can be incredibly beneficial. And so as we finish the uh, anti-SOAS or lateral or uh, type approach, we then instead of having to prep and reprep and redrape and flip, we can start placing these screws because these robotic arms are incredibly rigid and they go exactly where you want them to do. And I've done a, a few of these cases with jam sheeting needles. I've done a few of these cases with navigation. Those all work as well. Uh, but I have found that the rigid aspect of the robotic arm really completely changes the game in terms of this. We can see exactly what our rendering is going to be in both a 2D and a 3D format, even before we do the case. And ultimately, we can end up with something like this. And once again, these can be challenging to line up all these screw heads and certainly not as easy and not for everyone. Uh, but you can see as he's uh, doing the uh, anti psoas approach here, he has uh, one of his uh, 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 residents also accessing the posterior aspect and placing the screws really at the exact same time. And so here's what the construct should look like in terms of uh, the planning and ultimately what his x-ray looks like afterwards. So once again, he know now, now knows that he achieved the goals that he set out to do. So I think at this point, as we previously discussed, robotics are here to stay. Um, every company either has a robotic system, is developing one, or is trying to acquire a company with that. Certainly haven't been in the military for the better part of uh, 28 years. Uh, we know that a lot of these systems in terms of everything we're doing, uh, firearms, the pilots, uh, military aspects are really becoming down to automation, making things as efficient as possible and more reproducible for all of us. But as I stated earlier, Mike Lee published his paper now uh, five, four or five years ago, really stating that uh, this stuff you know, is safer, it is more reproducible, but we have to continue to train all of our surgeons, residents and fellows to be able to do all these surgeries multiple different ways in case technology doesn't work. So all these things that we thought very, a uh, very short time ago were really the future, I would say really are the now. And these systems are changing very rapidly. You'll see in the technology update uh, that will be a little bit later on today that uh, Martin and Joe in the Cadaver Lab are using some of these uh, new prototype instruments. And these systems really are one system at this point. It's not two separate, it's not robotics, it's not just navigation. It's really one holistic system that really can help our patients um, uh, do much better, can help us as surgeons take out some of the learning curve. And I think once again, makes it much re much more reproducible for all of us. Go ahead. Great talk, Ron. Um, seems like um, the, the quad rod and the kickstand, um, what, what would you be your advice for say, um, someone who's just uh, wanting to do that for a first case? Is that something that's better done in the cadaver lab first or uh, something that's just done with a senior surgeon or um, uh, I guess what's, what's the, what's the pearl there for that? 
I think it's a great first case out of the out of the gate. I think the very first time you get one of these systems, definitely do that case as the very first one. Now, I think it's incredibly important. You know, we talked earlier, and uh, Dr. Polly spoke earlier too, is that when you use these technologies, um, I don't think this is a sort of dink or dunk type of thing. You really shouldn't use it just for quote the hard cases or just a case that you're worried about it. You have to use it for everything, and I recommend using it in open cases, one, two, three level open cases. You know, then go into sort of percutaneous cases. Um, you know, deformity cases, those are sometimes a little bit more straightforward, especially like a T10 in the pelvis because your incision so large, so you're not fighting soft tissue and fascia. But you really want to try to use this on as many cases as possible and be very consistent. In addition to your learning curve, it's really the perioperative team's learning curve that's incredibly important. Um, so at this point, because I use pre-op CT to fluoro, when I walk in the OR, everything's draped, the system's on, the screws are already, you know, positioned. And we take an AP and a lateral or an oblique fluoro shot, and then we start placing screws. Um, so it is very efficient in terms of registration. So typically anywhere from about three to seven minutes to take those fluoro shots, make sure the system's working. And then it's 10 to 12 seconds per screw to basically acquire uh, those targets. Um, but if you're going to try these type of complex MIS cases, A, you have to make sure that you can achieve the goals of the patient like anything else. Um, and just because obviously Martin has uh, done some of these cases, it doesn't mean it's for everyone um, because these are challenging um, and ultimately it comes down to what's the best thing uh, for the patient. Um, but this is something that uh, you have to have a lot of patients to want to try um, and not every patient's appropriate for it. Um, and so I still prefer the open method with these types of large cases. Uh, but once again, I think Martin's had some uh, short-term success now with uh, these uh, quad rods through an MIS technique. All right. Thanks so much.